Hello and welcome to our next installment in our study of Ephesians. Uh, we have worked through the first three chapters in which Paul was describing the blessings that we have in Christ. So being in Christ results in a, in a number of things. And at the end of uh, chapter three, Paul uh, prays a prayer of, of intercession over the, the church in Ephesus uh, that they would um, be strengthened in, with power by the Spirit in their inner being, that Christ may dwell in their hearts through faith, that being rooted and grounded in love, they may have the strength to ha- comprehend what is the breadth and length and height and depth, to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, to be filled with the fullness of God. And he prays this because he knows that God is able to do far more abundantly than anything we could possibly imagine. And uh, what a what a great way to end that first section of what we have in Christ by reminding us that, that Christ is working in us, that the fullness of God might dwell in us in ways that we couldn't possibly imagine. That's a great way to kick off the second part of the letter to Ephesians, which has to do with how to live as a result of the blessings that we have in Christ. What are, what are the ways in which we are to live out our faith and our calling uh, as a result of Christ filling us with all of his fullness? And there are some very practical ways that, that this plays out. But he begins in chapter 4. We're in, in, uh, in Ephesians 4, 1 through 16. And Paul says, as a prisoner of Christ uh, uh, in, in jail for proclaiming the faith, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Uh, A couple of different folks have described this calling as um, uh, one, a a Methodist from the 19th century describes it as the uh, living out the benefits and privileges of this gospel that we have received. Since we have become in Christ, we are now called to do what Christ said to do. And what did Christ say to do? In Matthew 28, 19 through 20, it's pretty clear. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Um, We are to go and to make disciples and to teach what uh, has been uh, taught to us through the Spirit, through Christ's words in the scriptures through those who have dis- discipled us, who have made us followers of Christ. Uh, another uh, person says that we part of our calling is to partner with Christ as a as uh, as those having uh, rule and dominion over the new creation. That we will partner with Christ as the kingdom comes into this world. It's an interesting way of looking at it, and what when. We think about rule and dominion in, our, in the 21st century. Uh, one of the things we think about is is that in negative terms, uh, power, dominion, authority, and things like that. Uh, but what does it look like? It, it, Paul lists it here w- that we have humility, that we have gentleness with patience, that we bear with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Uh, There isn't a better way to think about exercising rule and dominion and authority in this realm through the Holy Spirit uh, than by doing it in humility, uh, gentleness with patience, uh, bearing with one another in love, and maintaining the the bond of peace as we pursue the unity of the body. Uh, So these things that... um, that Paul lays out in verses four through uh, six, this reminder that there's one body, one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs uh, to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and father of us all, who is over all and, and through all and all. Um, our unity is grounded in this great God who has called us to be a part of the body of Christ. And we've been given uh, a measure of Christ's gift uh, through grace. Um, and, uh, and, and so jumping down to, to verse 11, um, Paul is, is telling us this, this life that we live in the body, that we have all been given gifts to participate in humility, 
gentleness with patience, bearing with one another in love, upholding the bond of peace. Through these gifts that he has given to us. Not everyone has the same gifts, but just like um, one part of the body complements and aids another one, that's the way we're supposed to live as the body of Christ. And so what are some of the gifts? This is not an exhaustive list. There are multiple places in the, the New Testament where we find um, these uh, descriptions of what the giftings of the Spirit are like. First um, Corinthians 12 has a, has a, um, a, a great big list in there. Uh, but in particular to uh, the, the church at Ephesus, he's describing these things. Um, he's, he's given gifts that some may become apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. And these are all, um, unlike the list in, in first Corinthians 12, um, these are all around the, the functions and roles that some people have within the body in order to maintain a unity that is grounded in something we'll get to in here in just a few moments. Uh, but to help shepherd along the church. So you've got apostles, those who are sent out uh, to take the gospel and to plant new uh, churches. Paul was an apostle. Um, literally, the, the Greek word for apostle means uh, uh, to send. That's the, the, um, that's the, the verb form, apostello, uh, which is to send. I wouldn't read too much into that. Um, except to note that um, that apostles are typically those who are sent out uh, to to do particular things. Uh, he also uh, God also gave us prophets, people who who speak the word of truth. In First Corinthians fourteen, we we find that uh, the gift of prophecy is is one that is given for um, upbuilding, consolation, uh, and encouragement. So uh, uh, prophets tend to have uh, this gift where they might give a word of prophecy for one of those three reasons to other people. They also speak a word of truth, just like they did in the Old Testament. Evangelists, that ought to be clear. Uh, people with a, with a clear gifting for preaching the gospel and inviting people to follow Christ. Uh, shepherds, which is another word for pastors uh, and, uh, and teachers. These are just some of the gifts. Clearly not all. Uh, it's not an exhaustive list. But, but listen to the reason Paul gives for why God has gifted us within the body with different gifts. Uh, especially these um, type of, of leadership gifts. To build up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of faith and the knowledge of son and god of, of the son of god to mature personhood so all of these gifts are meant for, to do one thing to upbuild the church so if i have a uh, the gifting of of being the uh, a pastor the end goal is to build you up in faith to mature personhood and the word uh, mature here is one that is translated differently throughout the New Testament, but it is, it is one in the, the Wesleyan uh, theological world that we latch on to because it, it, it has that same root as the, the root that we talk about when we talked about entire sanctification, Christian perfection, um, being brought to completeness or maturity in faith. And so the, the role of all these gifts is to build up the church so that everyone may attain a maturity and a completeness of faith uh, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's the end of verse 13. So that we may have our eyes opened, just like he talked about in chapter 1, that we may be enlightened by the good news that we have been given. Uh, that we may receive the fullness of Christ, which is what Paul prayed about at the end of, of chapter 3, if you remember, uh, that, um, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God at the end of, of chapter 3, verse 19. Uh, giftings are meant to draw us together in the unity of the fullness of Christ in us.
there's a lot of talk about unity uh, in the church and in in the world today, and and uh, arguments and discussion and discussions over what that actually means and looks like. Um, and I think it's important to note that when we talk about unity, a a body, a human body, is only uh, functioning in a healthy way when all of its parts are working together to make the body healthy, to do what it was intended to do, to live out the fullness of its function. And Paul says, starting in verse 14, he says that we are to attain this fullness of Christ so that, so here's the reason we want to attain the fullness of of Christ in us, uh, the knowledge of the Son of God to mature personhood, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried out by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. He wants us to be mature and adult in the faith, in unity with one another, so that we don't get pulled in different directions by the cunning of human schemes, that we may know the truth of the scriptures, that we may be faithful uh, to the, the rule of faith that we find in the scriptures and within the church. Um, that we hold on to those more than we hold on to our own desires and wants. And to live faithfully, not for our own selves and our own purpose, but for the greater purpose of the life of the church. So that the church may function in the way that it is supposed to, which is a disciple-making organism uh, to, to help others enter into the kingdom of God. To to actually attain those blessings in Christ that we read about in chapters 1 through 3. To add more and more people to that in faithfulness and wholeness. Not being swayed um, by uh, every wind of doctrine, by human cunning or craftiness or deceitful schemes. Which we tend to see a lot of uh, as a result of not unity, but, um, but people operating out of their... Uh, their own dysfunctions and desires to be famous or uh, to gloss over um, the the sins that, that they enjoy most in life. No, Paul is calling us into a unity that is formed by the giftings of the Spirit uh, within the people uh, of the body, um, teaching us, guiding us, helping us to follow Christ in humility and gentleness and patience and uh, in peace that is bound together in the truth of God's word to us. And what does that look like? He says, rather, rather than these other negative things, that we speak the truth in love, that we grow up in every way into Christ, uh, who is the head, uh, from whom the whole body joined together, held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up together in love. And so instead of following the the um, the zeitgeist, the, uh, the the spirit of the age, that we follow instead in humility and gentleness with patience and peace, the way of Christ, that we submit ourselves to Christ who is the head of the body and to one another in love so that we may be equipped as a body to build up one another in love. And what that looks like isn't what every person decides for themselves, but is what God has ordained for us in this great calling to which he has called us to live it out in in the unity of, of our head who is Christ submitting ourselves to him and walking together in love. It's a pretty big uh, or pretty tall order there, but one that we not need not be afraid of pursuing because God can do far more than we could ever imagine provided that we submit ourselves to God and uh, and uh, and pursue the truth that he has offered us in his spirit and in his word, which I think is what we're trying to do as we study this book together, this letter to the church at Ephesus. So as you pursue that calling this week, 
Uh, my prayer for you is that the, the God who can do far more than you could um, uh, imagine would bless you uh, in ways that cause you to follow him more faithfully in humility, grace, and peace. We'll see you next week.